Hello and welcome to this episode of The Hollywood Experience. Um, some of you may or may not know who I am. I'm Adrian Paul and I have Ethan Detmeyer on the other end of the phone in some undisclosed location, uh, secretly in a vault somewhere. I don't know where he is, but you know. Yes, I'm in a nuclear sarcophagus buried 300 <laughs> feet down. 300 feet down. Okay, then. Uh, it's, it, you know, it sounds like one of those episodes from... Uh, um, you know, one of those uh, sci-fi movies. Oh, I'm underneath the caverns now. Oh, it's no movie, my friend. This is real. <laughs> this is. Real. I'm in a nuclear <laughs> silo, ready to rock. <laughs> yes, it's always always interesting to speak to you because uh, <clears throat> you have a lot of. What? Are, okay, so come on. In the silo, do they do movies? Do they do they show yes. movies? Have you seen any interesting yeah, movies? We have it. This this yet? Have, have we, well, have we, have we you know, we only have an eight millimeter projector here, so I see a lot of bad films that aren't really. You know, uh, foreign films, films from Italy, you know, a little something about that. But, uh, you know, every once in a while, I get a chance to view something special, not really about the flash. And some people still think it is actually. But there is something to be said for conventional story t- storytelling that can inspire an audience. And I think that's still the way to go. Oh, you, you just said flash. It was interesting. You said flash because you've actually got a, a photo behind you of Daniel what? Cudmore from the flash. No. Interesting. What a coincidence. Was that a coincidence? Was that an Ethan that my now Daniel Cudmore is going to be our guest today. He's been on uh, uh, a, a numerous things. He's a stunt actor, big, tall, big guy. Obviously, some of you know him from the X Men series of films. Um, you know, and he's done a, a numerous amount of stuff. Really nice guy. We'll, we'll bring come to that in a second. But I was curious, Ethan, was that just like um, just by chance that that happened that you said yeah it's strictly a coincidence i mean we're huge daniel cutmore fans here uh it's unbelievable how much respect we have for the guy in fact you should see my other room it's just a complete homage to him and his work (laughs) and uh you know i'm so thrilled because we'll have a conversation of what this man is really about and of course we're going to talk to daniel uh daniel cutmore spoke to him uh not so long ago we were uh, discussing a lot of different things uh, of course, X Men was one of the key things that we we started chatting about. So, uh, without any further ado, let's uh, let's go straight over to that interview. Hello, good morning, and uh, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, last week, actually, we were uh, t- talking with uh, Michael Hurst, and uh, this week I'm a little bit closer to home with Daniel Cudmore. Good morning, good afternoon, sir. How are you? I'm good. Thank you <laughs> again. Thanks for having me. I'm. Uh, the listeners will know I was a little late. I was a little scrambled trying <laughs> to figure out my link this morning. And as you can see, I, I set up this beautiful advertisement for Volkswagen behind me and <laughs> my garage slash office here in Vancouver. But uh, yeah, I'm good. How you doing? So how's Van? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good, man. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, it's kind of hot here now. It's got chill, chilled down a little bit, but it's been yeah. pretty brutal. What about up there? Is it? Uh... Uh, we've got some sun today. We did, I think about two weeks ago. Fall just came in and said, "Yeah, no, summer, you're done. See you later." So <laughs> how we, we started to cool down, like yesterday, I think it was uh, 24 Celsius, somewhere around there. Um, but it's it, at nighttime; it's dropping right down. But again, like the sun's out, so I'm I'm really not complaining. Yeah, well, you can't complain when the sun's out in Vancouver. No, because it comes because... out for a little bit of time. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's uh, I spent a lot of time in Vancouver. Is that where you've done most of your work in Vancouver? Yeah, but I was born and raised in Squamish, so just outside of Vancouver. It's like a 35, 45-minute drive up the road. Uh, most of my work's been done here, though I have done some work in Louisiana uh, and some sort of back east in Toronto and Montreal. Uh, but apart from that, you know, I, I maybe played around in England once or twice, nothing uh, too long. But as that every actor knows... That wasn't- that wasn't where you got your love of rugby, though, was it? No, no, that's from my, that's from my, <laughs> that's from my dad. That's, that's, my dad that's an, and, it's interesting to find an American rugby player because rugby's not huge here. No, but, and that's you know, funny because both my parents are British. Uh, so I'm first okay. generation Canadian. And uh, rugby was really the sport that allowed my dad to get into Cambridge. Uh, it kind of oh. helped catapult him in there and uh, he became a doctor. And so... You know, it was something that he loved playing. But when I grew up in the small town, there was there was no rugby. It was you had to play hockey, or that was it. <laughs> you know? so, so how did you play there? I mean, like, how did that, I didn't start that... playing until really late? Like my older brother started playing at eighteen. My younger brother played because he went to a boarding school for a year, and so he, he started there because uh, they say they model off of the the English sort of curriculum and and sporting. 
And, uh, and yeah, I didn't come, I came back from university playing football and, uh, I was just getting my foot in the door with acting and I still had a drive to play sports and, you know, my older brother and younger brother go, Oh, go down to the local club, start playing. And it just sort of, it clicked for me, uh, cause it basically ticked off all the boxes of every sport that I've played combined into one. Uh, and I just, I fell in love with it. Mm. What position did you play? I played, uh, well, four or five, second row, uh, okay. some six, but I really liked eight, eight man. Yeah, you're, you're eight. Okay. Is, yeah. yeah, as you know, with eight man, you can really know the game. And when you're fresh to the, to the game, you're kind of just... Yeah, you, do, you to have go. to know how to wheel the scrum. You have to know totally, how to, you know. Right? Yeah. I used so to play rugby, kind of, so that's why yeah, I Yeah, okay, so you get it, right? And yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was something that I pursued pretty heavily, but by the time I, unfortunately for me, but by the time I got into rugby, I had already had a knee surgery from football. I, I had a Achilles tendon tear. Like, yeah, I, gonna... I, th- I heard you had that problem with the knee. How, how, what, uh, what, what happened? Uh, I was 16. I blew, blew my knee out uh, playing basketball. And then uh, just subsequently Ooh. just knee tears playing football. Just, you don't know, just cartilage tears and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was still pretty good. The, the worst one was I, I snapped my ankle playing football and uh they misdiagnosed it they're like oh you're high ankle sprain you should be fine and uh for a guy like me i was going well you know i i'm the new kid i'm canadian i don't want to uh i don't want to sort of be the one who's complaining about it and uh, i just played on it all year and then it just tore up my achilles on my other side so how you 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 went into acting afterwards right after yes. after all this happened and, and yeah. was it do you think you know your athleticism kind of drew you toward the were you drawn towards the more bigger action type roles or the i was not action roles but i, I would say the more the bigger characters because i think sometimes as a an athlete you go into something looking at you're not playing the storekeeper in the corner right you're yeah. you're, you're playing more of the what, did, were you driven by those roles? Were you uh, not, headed towards those or not? I'm not sure if it was a conscious decision or maybe more subconscious. I mean, I I was that kid in class who was constantly uh, trying to get a rise out of everyone and joking around. So <laughs> by about eighth grade, the teachers are like, you got to go to drama because you just you need to get all these all these beans out. Right, and, uh, right. So then I go to drama class and everyone's going, you know, you're rewarded for all this behavior. And so I kind of fell into the world of, of comedy. <laughs> And that was my kind of thing. And so when I came back to Vancouver, I realized there was a, a massive industry and I wanted to sort of go, okay, well, can I try this out? Um, I think the industry being the shape and size that I was kind of pushed me into that avenue of the bigger action, bad guy, good guy, that sort of world. Because I wasn't, you know, being, I was 22 years old. I was six foot six, 260 pounds. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not going to, they're not going to go, Oh, there's a perfect guy for this new comedy. You know, it's just like, right, it's not right, 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 right. Um, and so I had to kind of learn to navigate. This is the way it's going to be until I can get to the point and the understanding and the skill set to go, okay, no, I want to, I want to lean towards more of this drama or I want to lean, can I, can I get into the, on this comedy? Um, but at the same time, when you first start out, you're just going hire me, like, let me play, like, give me something. <laughs> and I got super fortunate. I think it was my fourth or fifth audition, third job. And I go out for a cattle call for X-Men. Yeah. And, right. You know, six. For Rasputin Colossus. Yeah. Six callbacks later, they're like, all right, you got the job. And I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sh- shit. All right. I guess yeah. I did that. That, was, now I, now that must have been an it. interesting uh, introduction by fire, in a sense, in the industry. Because, a- you know, you don't, you're, you're not going into a small production. No, it was a total trial by fire. I really, you know, it was one of those kind of things where you just kind of um, close your mouth and open your ears uh, and just try. For me, I, I was always very big at observation learning, especially with uh, especially with all the sports I played. I was always kind of, all right, watch what this guy's doing. Why, why is he doing, why is he playing more than me? What can I fix and change in my game? So being around all of those amazing actors who have beautiful, huge resumes, I just thought, hey, this is a perfect opportunity for me to just sit back and watch, see what they do. Mm, uh, mm. So I spent, I'm not a big guy who sits in his trailer. I, I, I think I'm just sitting there twiddling my thumbs and going kind of crazy. So I come on a set and I just sort of sit and watch. Mm. I think that was kind of a, that was a great learning experience to watching that level of acting and 
that what do you think level. what do you think was the one thing you took out of that then in that sense you know i mean from that particular you know yes you've got all these things but you, there's yeah. there's always something you remember from it yeah it, i think it was just the the stillness and confidence that you know you understand that you're watching them and that this is their time uh, and all the busyness that's going on around them in this huge production isn't affecting what they're trying to do on the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and knowing that each actor was our, was so highly prepared for what they were doing on the day. So it's, it's just like any sport. You do all the work so that on the day you're free to just be in that moment to do instead of constantly thinking, okay, I got to change this. I got to change this. I can change this. All right. So here's another question for you in that case, because, the, the actors that work on those types of movies sometimes have been told six months ahead of time that they're going to be doing this role. So they've got a, a lot of time to prepare. Mm -hmm. Have you been on those productions where it's literally a much smaller production? And I know, I mean, I've just literally just done one where I came back last week. I was yep. told like the week before you're playing this role. So yep. I just left. I had five days to do something, six days to get this whole thing together and shoot yep. like loads of scenes in two days. So there's a, <laughs> the stillness yeah. sometimes can happen, but there's, <laughs> have you seen the difference between those two types of preparations? A hundred percent because I've been on both. Uh, and I think the industry is changing more nowadays with that because there is that content war and everybody wants, uh, they want to show yesterday. Uh, so they're, they're just throwing it at the actors, just come in and, you know, learn, like you said, five days, you've got a whole script to learn and, and you've got to build everything. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've been on those a lot, especially in Vancouver. It's kind of where it's going um, for me. And it, realistically, I think it, I think it is just trying to find those moments to prepare as much as you can. But I think for someone like myself, who's a bit more of a control freak, um, I have to just be okay with letting go of certain things and not, because sometimes I feel like with those big productions, you have so much time that you overthink things mm. and you can have those moments where you've overthought so many things and you just, you end up stop just reacting in the moment. And I think sometimes the nice thing with those quick ones, albeit they're stressful as all hell, you can just react. Like you only, you, you can only yeah. do so much. Well, the, it, it's, it's a, the same adage when you're working on a, on a scene sometimes and you get the, I don't want to say the, the grace to actually have more than two takes mm -hmm. but when you do three or four or five or six or seven or eight takes sometimes you're doing the same thing every time and it's not an organic place that that reaction has come from so okay. actually doing that one thing you got literally i did this one take boom done i'm like really that's it yeah. <laughs> was, yeah. you know you've got no time to think it's just literally a reaction sometimes those things come off the best yeah, and it's very true. And the, and as you know, it becomes trust in the people you're working with, even though you've only met them very briefly. So you just ultimately have to have trust in the people that are around you because, you know, it's a collaborative thing. So the director, the DP, and everyone who's behind the camera watching, if they're like, good, then you kind of have to, you kind of have to go, okay, like you got what you're trying to achieve in this scene. If it's something for me that I'm going, no. You know, if it's a one take and, and I know we've got a little bit of time to take another one and I just know that I took it in the wrong direction for whatever it is, character or story or, or arc, I, I'll ask for another one. But a lot of times I think I'm getting to that point where I'm okay with just saying, okay, if we're good, let's move on because we don't mm -hmm. have the time. Yeah, right. um, but it is, it's very true. Once you get to that, like you said, once you get to that sixth, seventh take, and especially if it's a close up, you know, the camera's, the camera's yeah. reading any BS that's coming through. And if you're just sitting in the place of just, okay, I've already muscle memory, I'm just kind of blurting out the dialogue and I'm not really feeling it, I'm not really in the moment, then it's kind of, it's, it's useless. It just doesn't work. Exactly. And it becomes by rope. Let yeah. me ask you something else. Did you, uh, by the way, did you work with Kelly Who? Uh, I, I did, but as you know, in those massive productions, it's like... No, I was just wondering. No, she's a good you friend worked on the same. Why, oh, I see. Yeah, you work on the same film and you only get to meet them at the premiere. So you're like, yeah, the, yeah, you know, the, right. Yeah. Like it, there was like days of future past that we did. We shot in different timelines. So there was just literally groups yeah. of actors that would work for three months and then you'd come in and work for three months. And well, then you worked on know. arrow as well, which was exactly yeah. that as well, which I did. I totally. worked on arrow as well. So, uh, right, like, right. so I know exactly what you're talking about. You yeah. don't see half the other cast. Somebody came up to me the other day and said, Hey, we, we were on the same episode together. I'm like, really? Okay, <laughs> yeah. great. Oh, that's great. Oh, you, you were great. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you were great. I loved you. Yeah, we were so well together when we never did. <laughs> it is. So, it's funny how that works. But then, you know, like you said, you were on those small ones and, and you get that sort of family feeling. Like I've done smaller pictures that I've had way more fun on because it is just a small, tight knit group. And you work with every, everyone right. you see yeah. all the yeah. time and you spend that time and then you work on those big ones and you feel kind of, you feel, you feel very distant. You don't feel like you're a part of it. And, and I think that's maybe one of the reasons why I, on those large ones, I'll come out of my trailer and just be around people. Cause I feel so sort of stuck in the corner by themselves, by yourself. Yeah.